Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at forecasting with autoregressive moving average processes. All right, so our goal is to take an autoregressive moving average process and predict future values. Now, in this video, for our predictions, we're doing everything from a theoretical point of view. We're not going to worry about actual model fitting at this point. We're not even going to really consider data. This is just a theoretical framework for what is going on when we forecast, when we predict with an, an ARMA process. All right, now we're going to run through some examples from time series analysis and its applications. Here are the authors. Here is uh, their GitHub page and UCF students can download this textbook for free through the library. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so we're gonna take the point of view that we have an autoregressive moving average process. So that is our, uh, you know, our random variable aspect you know, that we're working with, and we want to predict a future value. All right, so if you remember, we talked about prediction equations in a previous video for taking care of pure autoregressive modeling. But in this framework, even though you know this is we were baby stepping into this, the prediction equations don't really give us a whole lot of utility when it comes to an autoregressive moving average model. Once we put in that moving average aspect, things get a little bit more complicated. So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to take a different uh, approach and we're going to work out some details. Now. When we're, we're working through this, we're going to make the assumption that our ARMA process is uh, causal and invertible whenever we need to. And so uh, if it's, it would be advantageous to have a causal ARMA process, we're immediately going to do that. If it's advantageous for it to be invertible, we're going to do that, and we're not going to worry about stating the assumption. All right, so another thing we're going to do to make this easier for us to slug through the pencil and paper mathematics of this is that we're going to make the assumption that we are dealing with a zero mean uh, process. Remember, it has to be a stationary process, and we're going to say st uh, zero mean stationary for what's going on. Now, if we didn't have zero mean, from a theory point of view, we could just subtract the population mean, and now we do have a zero mean process. So that's okay. We're not losing any general generality on this. All right. So our equation is that we're going to have an autoregressive portion and a moving average portion in our process. So remember that B is the backshift operator. And so this is just setting up the, you know, incorporating the time series to be acted on, on uh, the coefficients uh, with the backshift operator uh, working on our, our time series. So you'll notice that here we have our observed values. Here we have our white noise time series that are in, in there. And we're going to go ahead and assume that we have Gaussian white noise. And the reason why we do that is just so that we have a nice, easy framework to work with. Uh, the main thing that we really need for this, for our white noise, is that we need zero expected value, and we need uh, constant variance with respect to time. All right, so in statistics, the, the first type of prediction you're ever going to do, guaranteed, is we're going to try and minimize the mean squared error. And specifically, we're going to use an expected value to do that. All right, so the mean of the minimum mean squared uh, error predictor is what we're going to uh, look at first. And that's pretty much all we're going to talk about in this video. All right, so what I want to do is I want to work with the expected value of the predicted time that we're interested in given all of our observed data. So this is saying I have observed this data. This is hard. This is concrete. There's no more randomness in this, this part. Here, we don't know what's going to happen m steps into the future. All right, so to denote this expected value, I'm going to go x sub nm. So this is the time that I'm interested in. And this is how far along in the time series do I have observed data. All right, so to make the calculations easier, uh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go ahead and say that we have infinite past, if that is appropriate for the calculation. So 
in certain situations, basically when things work out the way we it makes it easier, we'll go ahead and go further and say that it, it, if it's if it makes it easier for us, if it makes the math work out, we'll go ahead and say that the time series has an infinite past and all those infinite values are fixed known values to us as we're doing this computation. So in general, this expected value, which is based off of the last n observations and this expected value that's based off of infinitely many in the past observations will not be the same. But for large samples, they'll be approximately the same. And since uh, you know we're, we're doing a, a theoretical aspect, we're going to say approximately is good enough for us to have a framework to work with. All right, so now let's go ahead and invoke ca uh, causality and invariable time series. All right, so under these, we know that the observed value is going to be equal to a series on the white noise time series. And the white noise is going to be equal to the sum of these coefficients times our observed values. And we're going to go ahead and say that the, uh, the initial coefficients are equal to zero for both of these. All right, so now, if we take the infinite past conditional expected value for the observation that we are interested in that we're trying to predict, well, I'm going to go ahead and grab this formula here and I'll slap this down. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take an expected value on both sides. All right, when I take the expected value on both sides, notice that this is white noise. All right, so what will end up happening when I take the expected value on this is that a lot of these terms are gonna go ahead and cancel out. And so that gives us a formula for this expected value. All right, so the expected value here, up here, on the past values, they're constant. They're hard, they're fixed, because we're taking the point of view that everything is known about the past. But the expected value for future observations of our white noise terms is gonna be equal to zero. All that cancels out. And so that makes things a lot easier. And notice that, when I've got J, we're shifting backwards on that. And that's why this summation works out. All right, so now we did that using this formula. Let's take this one and basically just do the same thing. And so we're gonna end up getting another summation for our white noise. So here, here's my white noise. I'm trying to understand the white noise for the value that I'm trying to predict. All right, well, I know that's equal to this just by that formula. Let's take expected value of both sides. So it's a conditional expected value. So I'm conditioning on the infinite past. Well, by the definition of X tilde, this is just X tilde. All right, well, what that does for me over here, this is a future white noise value that has expected value zero. All right, so boom, this is zero. That tells me that this summation itself has to be equal to zero. Now, let's break up the summation into individual parts. So here is the part that we're actually interested in. Here, we're going up to M minus one. And here is everything further back in time. Okay, and so now I just have a formula for that. All right, so now let's go ahead and take advantage of this formula. I'm going to take the, my future observed value minus the expected value here. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use that summation formula that we used a moment ago for this. And then I'm going to subtract off this part. And then boom, we can see that uh, you know a bunch of terms cancel out and we're left with this. All right.
All right, so now let's talk about our mean squared prediction error. All right, so what we're going to do is that I'm going to take my future observation minus the expected value on conditioning on infinite past, square the difference, take the expected value. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invoke the formula that we just worked out for that difference. And now I look at that and I realize I've got white noise terms. All right, white noise terms that have not been, it hasn't been like nailed down what it is. If it's a future value, the covariance between white noise is always equal to zero for unobserved data. Therefore, I know a lot of things are going to cancel out. When I do the squaring, all of the cross terms are going to cancel out when I take the expected value, and we end up getting this nice little formula right here. All right, so now let's think about the correlation between our prediction errors. All right, so if I take the expected value of observation difference with its expected value and a different time, so you notice I've got plus k here. So here this is n plus m. This is n plus m plus k. So it's potentially a different time step. And once again, we're taking the difference. All right, well, here, I'm just going to sit through. I'm going to work through the details of this. And, you know, so notice that this is a product with this. So I'm going to have multiplication. And I'm going to multiply these terms. And once again, I'm going to use the fact that uh, a lot of the expected values are going to cancel out and disappear when we when we multiply uh, future white noise terms that have different time aspects. And what will be left is when the time matches up. So that gives us our correlation between prediction errors. Now, for long range forecasts, so let's say that M is, you know, pretty large, larger than the degree of our either degree of our autoaggressive moving average process, we want to make a prediction for that future. Okay, so what we're going to do, once again, I'm going to take that formula, I'm going to take future value minus the overall population average. You notice that this time I'm not using conditional. This is the overall one. Well, this I'm going to slap into here and just and just slug through and take the expected value of it. All right. And so as I work through with this, when I take this expected value, you see I bring in the expected value into here. And I notice that once again, I'm taking expected values on white noise. That means all of the unobserved values are going to be equal to zero in that expected value. It, for all the observed values, it's going to be constant, and it's just going to be whatever it is. And so, boom, we get this going on. So this gives us an expected value on our future value, given what we have observed. Now, in the setup of this for the ARMA process to mathematically make sense and to work out, these fees have to go to zero exponentially fast. All right, so if they go to, if they go to zero exponentially fast, then what's going to end up happening is that for a large enough uh, value of M, all of the values uh, added up would be uh, within a certain uh, within a certain tolerance level. And so it works out that this summation, if I have a large enough M, is, is going to be so small, it's going to be negligible. And so that means that we can have, our expected value is going to converge on the population overall expected value. All right. And so using this idea once again of taking a limit, I can do take my prediction error. Take the limit as m goes to infinity. You notice I've got infinity up here. Well, I can re-engineer this. I can go backwards on the work I did to establish the summation. When I do that, I look at, hey, this 
It's the same as the expected value of the white noise squared. All right, well, this is an expected value. I have a summation and multiplication. So let's go ahead and pull the expected value, the expected value backwards out. All right, so now I have the sum of expected values, or sorry, the, the sum of terms, expected values on the outside. Now I look at that and I remember that that was actually the same as squaring the entire value, then taking the expected value. And so this, lo and behold, if we remember from the previous video, this expected value, the whole thing, is equal to this expected value, which immediately we identify as this is being x. And so in fact, this ends up being the variance of x itself. Isn't that slick? Now, with this, you have to really, really, really remember all the steps that you did previously to get to this point with prediction error and variance. But, you know, if you remember it, you can flow through this and boom, boom, boom. All right, so since we have that rapid convergence to zero, a causal ARMA process converges to its overall mean quickly and its prediction error converges quickly also. When it is small, we can use the prediction equations for long range forecasts. So if I had a small number of data points and uh, a relatively small, uh, you know, far, you know, future value that I'm in, you know, time, small number of steps into the future. So if I have a relatively small data set, and a relatively small number of steps into the future that I want to forecast for, I can use the prediction equations and I can slug through it and I can get this. But it's going to get complicated pretty fast if I want to go pretty far out or if I have a large data set. Now, when n is large, we're going to truncate the results from the conditional expected values to get the long range forecast. And uh, since we do not uh, observe all of the negative index values. And so here we're just like, you know, stepping out all the different, all the details of this. And so what we're doing is we're just chopping off the terms that are going to be close to zero within that tolerance aspect. So for a sufficiently large M, this is going to be close to zero. We're not even going to worry about it. And so we'll use this as our prediction. All right, so, and we approximate the prediction error with the prediction error before the, we do the truncation. All right, so, you know, now for an autoregressive process where I've got more data than I have degrees, the prediction equations give an exact predictor. And so we don't need to do this approximation trick. We've already got it. We don't need to worry about it. For a moving average process, or an ARMA process, we need to use this truncation to be able to get through it. This is why we haven't talked about uh, forecasting with moving averages very much. All right, so now let's go ahead and de you know get, get into the weeds of it. Let's get into the autoregressive moving average truncated predictors. All right, so let's go ahead and say that I have an autoregressive moving average process and I want to forecast some value of M into the future. Okay. And so here, let's say that this is our setup. So here is our autoregressive portion. Here is our moving average portion of our model. Now, when it comes to this for the auto for the autoregressive portion, the we're gonna say that far enough back into the past the observations were all zero, just to make the math just wipe out so we don't have to worry about it. And here, when remember that this is an estimated value. There, there should be a hat on this, by the way. Yeah, there should be a hat right there. Um, all right, so if I, if I have the estimated value of an observed value, it's going to be the observed value in there. And when we're doing the white noise, what we're going to do, we're going to take the white noise terms for the ones that we've seen for our observed data far enough back into the past. We're going to count it as zero. 
far enough into the future since that zero expected value, we're going to count as zero and we're not even going to worry about it. So what we're doing here in this formula, for my observed points of time, I'm going to put my white noise time series terms in there. For my observed points in time, for the autoregressive, I'm going to put the observed values. Now, when we go into the future, what we're going to do, we're going to replace these terms with the forecasted value. And so in a way, we're going to have like an echo chamber going on because let's say that I want to predict 10 steps into the future. Well, I'm going to, at some point as I do my calculations, I'm going to have to put one step into the future into this model. All right. And then I'm going to have to put two steps into the future into this model, three steps and so on. And so uh, if I go far enough out into the future, at some point, everything that's in the equation is a future value for the autoregressive and zero for all the moving average values. So for large values of M, we're going to replace the observed data with forecasted values, and the white noise terms will be zero and dropped out completely. And so this is an echo chamber effect. If I have a poor model, when I set up this process in my modeling, things can go off the rails pretty bad because of this echo chamber effect. So it's something to be ready for. All right, so th there's a lot of nuance in this. This is pretty thick. So what I want to do, I want to back up. I want to take a look at this in a little bit lighter format. We're going to just go with, you know what, let's go with the simplest autoregressive moving average process that we could get. Let's go a degree one, one. All right. So here, this is going to be our process that our, the upcoming value is equal to a constant times the current value plus a new white noise term plus a constant times the previous white noise value. All right. And so now, if I set m equals 1 with this, then, of course, I, I'm going to get the formula we just set up. And in this setup, phi sub 1 is equal to phi, theta sub 1 is equal to theta, and we're just going to put the, the appropriate value on there. So we're going one step ahead. That means that we just take the last observed value into there. This was equal to zero because it, uh, we're not, you know, we have, uh, it, it's a future white noise value. We don't know what it's going to be. The expected value is zero. And here we're taking the previous white noise value and plugging it in. All right, now if we go two steps ahead, what will end up happening is that when I work out the details, once again, I'm gonna have a fee and you'll notice I don't have any moving average part at all. And so for larger values of M, it's just going to be a constant times the previous forecasted value. There should be a tilde on this X right there. All right. So if we go through and we rewrite our process equation, we can see that this is going to be for our white noise term is going to be equal to this. And so we're going to rewrite the calculation so that now we can focus on the white noise and see what we can get from that. All right. And to initialize the calculations, we're going to go ahead and just start off with saying that the initial white noise value is zero, the initial uh, autoregressive value is zero, just so that we can kick things off and get the process started. All right. So now let's invoke the uh, causal and invertible assumptions of the autoregressive moving average process. All right, so in this format, I know that if I take this portion times this portion, so here, this is the fees, the actual coefficients. Here, I've got the size. This has to be equal to the thetas part. Okay. Well, now I know that all of these are equal to zero because it's a uh, degree one. I know that all of these are equal to zero because it's degree one 
All right, so and so I'm left with just this part here, dropping the subscript because it's not needed for this process. I am left with this here. Okay, so now let's go ahead and see if we can work out some details of what's going on here. All right, well, I've got this. Let's go ahead and divide both sides and create a rational function. All right, so now I have a power series equal to a rational function. So if I can get that rational function's power series, the coefficients on the right will equal the coefficients on the left, and I can work out the details of these psi coefficients. Okay, so now I'm going to rewrite this to make it a little bit easier to work with. So this is... If I, if I focus on the denominator here, I can see that that looks a lot like a geometric series. It just needs a little bit of touch up, just needs a little bit of work. I've got this thing kind of floating around being a pain in the neck. All right, so I'm going to rewrite things. So first and foremost, I wanted to get, I rewrote this to get this one out by itself because I, you know, that, that, can, that reconfirms that psi sub zero is equal to one. That helps me know that I'm, you know, that, that I'm on the right track as I'm working through. Now I have this term times this, and this is one of those things where like, hey, I recognize that as a geometric series. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna rewrite this as a geometric series. Now, when I do this on this step right here, I have to have the setup that on the complex plane, Z has to have a radius, uh, 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 Z has to have a uh, radius of convergence that is positive. It just has to be, uh, this, this formula has to work out for something greater, for just some Zs other than zero. Not a lot of them, it doesn't have to be a very big area, it can be pretty small, but because, there are, because of there's infinitely points, infinitely many points, inside any uh, positive radius circle on the complex plane, this mathematics will work out. So here, this is a series. Well, now I look at that, and now I don't have any fractions at all. We hate fractions, right? You know, everybody hates fractions. I got rid of them in this step. Now I have infinitely many terms, so that's okay. Now I'm going to go through, I'm going to distribute this across the infinite summation. And so now my sum becomes this. And so I look at this. Now I need to go through, I need to match the coefficients. Now everything matches up nicely, except I have j plus one here. This j plus one means that things aren't, I mean, at this point I could, could just spot it, look at it and make the adjustment. But I went ahead and I replaced j with j minus one here. Oh, this should be a minus one. And so when I shift the index on the inside of the summation, I have to shift the index in the opposite direction on the outside of the summation. And so then we can see that phi sub j is equal to this. So how do I get that? Is I say that this phi here, when with a subscript of one, has to equal, when I have j equals one here, the, the coefficient I get or z has to match the coefficient of z over here. When I have j equals two, the coefficient I get here has to match the coefficient I get here. And then boom, we have a beautiful formula. Everything works out great. Now let's talk about the prediction error. All right, well, for the prediction error, what we're gonna do is I already have this formula established. I know what the size are, Let's just go ahead and plug them in and everything will work out beautifully. And so I'm going to go ahead and replace the size with the formula we just worked out and skipping a few steps. This is what we're going to get. Now I'm, I notice that this itself is a geometric sum. It's geometric sum. That means it's telescoping. I can rewrite this in this rational fraction format. We hate fractions, but you'll notice that it's nice and clean. I don't have any summations. And so now, Using this, now that I have my prediction error, I can get my prediction interval. Boom, check that out. And so now on my prediction interval, this is going to correspond to the distribution of the forecast after we consider things such as uh, correction terms like Bonferroni. Um, 
it is possible that uh, under reasonable assumptions that this would be connected to uh, Gaussian uh, distribution. All right, so let's actually run through an example. Now in this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the recruitment data from the ASTSA package, and we're gonna go ahead and fit the model. We haven't talked about fitting the model yet, but we're going to just like let it run and see what happens. So we're gonna go ahead and do ordinary least squares fitting of the model. And so here we can see that we get our coefficients and this is picking up autoregressive degree two. Here is the variance of our predictions. And so here, this is the model that we would be working with here. Let's go ahead and go ahead and make predictions because that's ultimately why we're doing this, to try and anticipate the future. One thing that you'll notice that is that we're gonna get pretty wide intervals going here. Look at how wide these intervals are. Here's the plot, here's the original data. Here are the forecasted values. Here is that 95, approximately 95% uh, prediction interval. Look how wide that is. That's crazy wide. The negatives don't even make sense. Now, something that is in this section of the textbook is backcasting. So backcasting, the big idea is that we reverse the order of our time series, run time series analysis, run prediction, and then after I get the predictions, re-reverse everything into the original order. Now, why do we do this? Well, this effectively gives us imputation on values that occurred before we had uh, observed data. And so I've done this professionally. Uh, you know, so the, in particular, I was asked to uh, predict pretty far out with very little data and to be able to even run the forward model, I ended up doing a pretty deep backcasting first, then going forward. Uh, this, this was a pretty shaky model for me when I did this, but this was a tool that got me through a project so that my supervisor was happy and was satisfied with what was going on. And so backcasting, really, the punchline is reverse what's going on, run your predictions as if you had not reversed the data, reverse things back, and run with it as being the prior values. Well, that's all I've got for you. Life is short. Do math.